Today's presentation is COVID-19, Building for Today and Tomorrow, Therapeutic Considerations for Children and Pregnant Women. Today's speakers are Drs. Patrick Smith, Jeff Barrett, and Karen Roland Yeo. Patrick is currently a Senior Vice President of Integrated Drug Development Strategy at Sertara. He has over 20 years of global drug development experience. He also holds a research professor appointment at the University of Buffalo School of Pharmacy. Patrick earned his PharmD from UCSF and completed a clinical residency at Duke University. He's authored more than 125 peer-reviewed publications. Joining Patrick is Jeff Barrett. Jeff is currently a senior advisor to the CEO at the Critical Path Institute. Previously, he was the head of quantitative sciences at the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. Early in his, earlier in his career, he was a professor of pediatrics and director of the Laboratory for Applied PKPD at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Jeff holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Drexel and a doctorate in pharmacokinetics from the University of Michigan. He has co-authored over 170 manuscripts on PKPD clinical pharmacology, and pharmacometrics. Karen Roland Yeo is currently a Senior Vice President for Client and Regulatory Strategy at Sertara's UK's SIMSIP division. Previously, she was the head of PBPK Consultancy Services at SIMSIP. She has expertise in developing models used for dosing of special populations, including pediatrics and pregnancy. Karen earned her bachelor's degree with honors in physics from the University of Natal in South Africa. She earned her doctorate in drug metabolism from the University of Sheffield, and she has authored or co-authored more than 70 peer-reviewed articles. Patrick, Jeff, and Karen, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to Patrick to begin the presentation. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending. It's really nice to be here today. And we're going to be discussing some important topics that have been often overlooked in this pandemic, which is the management of COVID-19 disease in children and in pregnancy. So we have much to learn in terms of the epidemiology, pathophysiology, and natural history of COVID-19 disease in these populations. What we do know is that there appears to be some very important differences in this disease by age. Summarized on this slide is data from the CDC up through April 25th. The figure on the left shows that the likelihood of testing positive increases with age, with children zero to four years with especially low positivity rates and the incidence increasing with their, with increasing age. On the right side, we see that children are also at a much lower risk of having severe disease requiring hospitalization. This is very good news. You could certainly imagine that our reaction to this pandemic would probably be quite different if children actually experienced similar mortality rates uh, compared to elderly patients. It's also been reported that up to a third of children are asymptomatic which on one hand is a positive because they don't experience such significant disease, but on the other hand, it becomes a very important and challenging population to manage from a public health perspective as asymptomatic individuals might spread the disease unknowingly throughout the population. So while the rate of disease and certainly the rate of severe disease in children is low, that doesn't mean that severe disease doesn't happen. It certainly does. And there have been numerous reported fatalities in pediatric patients. This slide summarizes comorbidities associated with hospitalizations, both in kids and in adults. And what we can see is that many of the hospitalized children have comorbid conditions, uh, mainly impacting the lung, things like asthma and cardiovascular system, so similar to what has been reported in adults. 
So as the world is looking for ways to treat adults for COVID-19, it's also important to recognize that identifying safe and effective treatment options for children is an important goal. So much of the activity currently is associated with repurposing existing drugs for adults. And this includes the testing of novel dosing regimens, which are designed to make sure that adequate concentrations are achieved in the lung to be able to inhibit viral replication. It will be extremely important as these effective adult dosing regimens are identified that we can translate these into appropriate dosing regimens for children. So I did want to share this uh, one study with you, which may shed some insight into why children don't have as severe a response to COVID infection compared to adults. So this was a publication from a couple of years ago before COVID, but the lesson still may be relevant. The authors studied pulmonary host response in patients with ARDS grouped by age. They measured various inflammatory biomarkers in the lung fluid of these patients. And what they found was that the level and profile of pro-inflammatory markers tended to be quite a bit lower and quite different in pediatric patients compared to adults. So if you look in the upper right plot, this is IL-6, which has been associated with poor outcomes in COVID. And notice this is a log scale, but you can still see apparent differences in these biomarkers by age. So it may be that there are some differences in the inflammatory response related to ARDS in children compared to adults. And it may be that children, therefore, uh, are less likely to have significant cytokine storm, which is known to lead to poor clinical outcomes in this disease. While the data in kids is sparse, even less is known about COVID-19 disease in pregnancy. And I refer here to two publications which describes the disease course in pregnant women, one out of New York City and the second one out of Wuhan, China. In the New York study, this group tested every woman who came in for a delivery in a New York area hospital. So in total, they reported on testing in 215 women 1.9% of them were tested positive with symptoms, and 13.7% of those were positive but asymptomatic. The vast majority of these cases had mild disease and recovered without clinical sequelae. This is also consistent with data reported out of Wuhan. And so overall, it doesn't appear that there is an increased risk of severe disease in pregnant women, but much still remains to be learned about managing these uh, types of patients. So with that background, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jeff Barrett, who will be discussing readiness in pandemic situations like this. In particular, how can the global community collaborate, share, and learn together to better manage subpopulations of patients where there are so few cases and so little information available. Dr. Barrett. Thanks, Pat. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, again, thank the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you all today, uh, unfortunately, under these circumstances. But uh, in any event, I think we all recognize that uh, while COVID-19 may not be polio, it's, it's certainly uh, a concern for, for uh, those of us who have children and also who may be uh, pregnant. So it's, uh, it's an issue that we have to contend with. So in terms of readiness for the future, I think uh, we need a little bit of level setting. So what does readiness mean in this context? So the first thing in most um, at, the, at the forefront here is, is quick access to the relevant information that would provide guidance and therapeutic options for caregivers. So in order for us to respond quickly, the, this access has to be implicit. And I think we've made some strides in this, but I don't think uh, anyone appreciates the fact that we were really anticipating uh, COVID-19. And then putting together realistic guidance with respect to dosing and outcomes consistent with the, the agents that are under consideration in, in this uh, initial process of repurposing. And then finally, a mechanism to learn from our experience. I think this is the most important aspect of this. It's all well and good to 
collate the information and provide guidance, but we have to be able to share this information in real time and then reflect on the learnings as, as the, uh, the knowledge progresses. Um, and I think the, the other important aspect of this is that uh, it's a daunting task to manage pharmacotherapy in, in children and pregnant women in general in the absence of a pandemic. So with, with COVID-19, um, while the severity, as you heard from Dr. Smith, may not be as severe as, as other uh, life-threatening indications in children and pregnant women, it's still very relevant. And every parent who has a child that suffers with this or every woman who's about to deliver has certainly got this on their mind. I know myself, I have a niece that's going to deliver twins in, in two months, and it's all we can talk about as a family. But let's talk about the current situation in the both inpatient and outpatient settings. So if you look to the left-hand panel here, this kind of gives you at least the context for how dosing guidance is provided. So on the inpatient side, and having been there in a research hospital, I could tell you there's, there's a formulary listing that collates all the information around the available drugs that are on, listed on formulary, and then there could be compendial sources that are provided that give us a summary of the available dosing information. But I'd say mostly this is static information and it, re it revolves around hospital committees to generate internal guidance. So again, the second checkbox here implies that there's constant communication between uh, the physician and pharmacy communities in conjunction with caregivers. And this actually happens on a very routine basis. But ultimately this rolls up into the caregiver making the best medical decision that they can in compliance with hospital guidelines. So this is, again, a daunting task to caregivers in an inpatient setting. It becomes more challenging on the outpatient setting when what uh, the, the caregiver and the parent has to work with is, is typically just the drug monograph or the package insert. And again, there may be consults with uh, prescribers or pharmacy caregivers, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. And, and ultimately, it's the caregiver probably the parent that has to make the best medical decision uh, for the benefit of their child. Now the happy news is that after three decades of research, we have accumulated a lot of information around the dynamics associated with uh, pediatrics in terms of developmental and maturational effects of physiologic changes that occur over time. And the relationships that underpin a lot of these uh, physiologic parameters are actually well-defined. They've been validated to a certain extent, and they've been vetted through regulatory authorities. And the same is true of the dynamics around pregnancy. So in addition to this knowledge being accumulated and stored, we have the development of mature tools that are available on our disposal. And, and Dr. Yao will show you some excellent examples of this. But suffice it to say, this is really at least a, a step in the right, right direction in terms of accumulating the knowledge and also some practical considerations regarding the sharing of information. So this is a, a good thing. Now, of course, when you overlay the uh, dynamics of the disease progression, this is a situation that's very dynamic. It's changing over time, and it reflects our current understanding of disease progression, but this too changes over time. So we would like to leverage what we know, but also identify what we don't know. The other thing that uh, to keep in mind here is that this uh, is a schematic from a publication that, that is really only a couple months old. This is changing over time. Our knowledge about the disease progression and potential targets is, is very fluid and it's, it's also being updated as we do clinical investigation. So this can't remain in the realm of a cartoon. It has to be vetted against new information and challenged and, and then overlaid with respect to the risk associated with the, both the developing child as well as pregnant women. So we shouldn't be satisfied with any snapshot in time. We should reflect on the fact that it will change. And even things such as vertical transmission, there may be some compelling information from the case studies thus far, but this too may change. And in fact, if you think of that situation, for most of the deliveries that have occurred, this have been in a surgical setting where the, the child was removed from the parent almost immediately so and separated. So we really don't have a clear picture of, of some of these factors. We've, we've made some generalization and assumption based on the existing knowledge but this too will change over time. So in terms of uh, what has to happen next, it's really this landscaping of the prior knowledge. Where does the information exist that would inform us to make better decisions, both in terms of what's realistic, in terms of repurposing uh, current drugs in development or old drugs, in fact, relative to targets that we need to develop further. So I think the list is in categories and, and recognize that uh, 
again, this is also represents a snapshot in time that will evolve as the information evolves. And also, there's a placeholder here for expert opinion. So we shouldn't um, basically not include those on the front lines dosing children, collecting information, and pulling together the practical experience with respect to caring for patients. Um, they have to have a voice in this process, and, and we have to provide a platform that integrates all this information and uses it efficiently. So if we drill down to the actual data sources in question here, now we have highly structured data from a lot of the clinical trials that have been conducted. We could think of places such as clintrials.gov as, as one place where the summary information resides, but this isn't necessarily efficient. We shouldn't be satisfied with this current view of this. This has to get better in terms of our future readiness. There is obviously real-world data sources that reflect the, the considerations that are happening now as these uh, patients are being treated. This could include electronic medical records, insurance claim, social media registries. We shouldn't rule any data source off the plate in terms of its value of information. But again, I would say there is this issues associated with the readiness of usability of this data. So the dirty work behind the scenes of assembling it, getting it ready for analysis, has to be part of our future readiness. And then finally, the compendial data. Most of this is in static form, or it could be in a form of that it's viewable, but not necessarily ready for um, utility in terms of the models and tools that we would build on the fly. Some of the data that uh, revolves around formulary information likewise needs to be assembled in, in a ready format and also reflect the changing environment of the reaction to uh, good and bad outcomes that occur. Now, in terms of our vision for the future, we would like to see an environment where the, the repository of all the relevant information for both pregnant women and children is accumulated this should be an open environment so that there's the opportunity to exchange information and knowledge. And then the tools and models that we build that you're going to see uh, in more detail in the next presenter become curated and also there's a, a mechanism to update them. There's an ownership of this and it's, it reflects the knowledge and information of the growing data sources and the medical opinion. So my challenge to all of you on the call is to see which part of the, uh, the U-shaped bucket that uh, your knowledge informs and contribute to this. I think this is uh, the real message of today is that this isn't something that should occur in a vacuum and it should reflect basically the diversity and knowledge of this entire community to inform this environment so that we can make better decisions for these vulnerable populations in the future. So again, with, with that, I, uh, I would like to pass it to uh, Dr. Yao, who will give us a much more in-depth look behind the curtain for some of the models as they've evolved. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, on the uh, right-hand side, uh, you can see that we've got the uh, chloroquine. And typical doses given for adults in um, malaria would be about 1,500 1, megs over three days. And in children, it's 25 megs per kid given over three days. And so typically, obviously, we know that uh, you know this drug is being repurposed for COVID-19, and therefore we have to think about what dose adjustments would be made to give a, would be made to give a similar dose in children, and of course these are the types of questions on the left hand side that we need to be thinking about whether we can do um, weight based dosing, or whether we can actually um, or whether we can also simulate the um, the dose required in neonates. So. This was actually based on a publication in, that appeared in CPT recently. And this is really important because what essentially happened was the Dutch Center for Infectious Disease Control recommended a, do a dose in, in adults of about 44 mg per kilogram uh, of chloroquine for treatment of COVID-19. But that what they wanted to be able to do was actually give dose recommendations for a in a pediatric setting. And so what this group did was they used PBPK modeling and essentially the SimSit simulator in this instance to actually determine what doses were needed in children of these age groups on this left-hand side. And these were the, this is the dose adjustment advice that is given in order to be able to have a dose equivalent to 44 megs per kg in adults. And so going forward, it's important to sort of recognize, well, how did we get there? Because yes, this publication appeared, simulations were run by this um, Dutch group, 
but it was done very quickly and they were able to hit the ground running and run these simulations and get this publication out there. And I'm using the word we here because it was essentially a collaborative effort. If you think about the modeling and simulation, we needed to have a, a compound file ready for chloroquine. And this formed part of the global health repository. And this work here was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And essentially, the project involved collating data for about 30 different compounds over a three-year period. These compounds are listed below. And the ones in red are actually reflect the, um, the compound files that we used in the, um, in, so far in the COVID-19 setting. But I just want to mention, this was a three-year program of work, very intense. And these files are available on the Global Health Repository and the Satara website. Not all of them are available at the moment, but um, they're being curated and then will be uploaded as soon as possible. But obviously, the important thing to consider here is that for a lot of these drugs, they're all drugs. And therefore, I think there seems to be a, it seems to be a perception that there are lots of data available. And that if we want to be able to build models for these drugs, it should be simple because there are lots of clinical data out there and lots of in vitro data. Well, the problem is it's because they're old drugs that often there aren't sufficient data available. And therefore, as part of collating the data and getting everything ready, what happened was um, essentially in vitro data had to be determined. The good thing about this was that most of the data was generated you know, for the compounds in a single laboratory using similar um, in vitro experiments or assays, and therefore you're essentially comparing like with like. But also, importantly, a lot of these drugs are really complex. They have solubility issues. They're metabolically stable. And therefore, it was quite involved making sure that the um, in vitro experiments were able to capture the data required. So going on from this, what we can do is once we've got the data, we can feed this model from the Global Health Repository file into a PBBK model, which is a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model, simulate this, combine it with the system component scale, and what we can do is predict the PK of the drug of interest for a dosage regimen of interest. And of course, on the left-hand side, what we're looking at here is we can also simulate the effect of intrinsic and extrinsic factors on these system parameters within a PDPK model. And of course, what we're interested in is having a look at the impact of um, pediatric parameters changing with age on the exposure of the um, drug. So these, obviously, um, we have many parameters uh, that are going to change. But what I'm focusing on here, really, are the key parameters that are really going to be affected um, in children when we're thinking about a chloroquine dose. So these are the, um, the relationships with age for each of these parameters. And the pediatric model itself is actually presented and explained very well in this publication listed below. And so what I'm going to do is just essentially skip through these different changes here. But it's important just to show you the different data sets that have been collated from sources that are available and that Dr. Barrett mentioned in his presentation. And of course, what we can do is define the relationship with age and look at these different age groups, because it's important to be able to apply the maturation renal function, the ontogeny associated with each of the enzymes, protein binding, hematocrit changes, and also organ and blood flows. I think it's also important to say that these models have um, received FDA and EMA support and certainly in dose projection in children. And there have been an increasing number of publications over the years showing their application and importantly showing verification in children of different ages for a number of different drugs in development and also drugs that have been um, well documented and well investigated, such as midazolam and so on and so forth, and other probe drugs. So we've talked so far about the data that are required and how we get there. 
and also the PBBK model itself. But of course, what we have to do now is decide what is the appropriate dosage regimen in children of a specific age that we would give in order to be able to attain the plasma concentration. And in this particular case, what we're looking at here is just simulations of plasma exposure of chloroquine in children based on different ages. And essentially, what was done here was that the, um, as I mentioned, the Dutch recommended uh, a dose of 44 mg per keg for a 75-year-old adult. Simulations were run using the pediatric um, a population within the SimSip simulator, and then to see what the exposure would be if that dose was used in children of this age. And then adjustments were made and just to make sure that a similar or a dose equivalent exposure could be captured in the plasma. And this is essentially what is shown on the left-hand side here. You can see the different age groups. And then on the right-hand side, what I'm showing here is the table that was shown in the beginning of the presentation, just about the dose advice that was actually, or the recommendations that were actually made. Importantly, when we're thinking about um, exposure in pediatrics, what we have to understand here is that in order to be, for us to be able to extrapolate the doses, we have to really understand the disposition of the drug. And what we're looking at here is the contribution of the different mechanisms of clearance to, uh, to chloroquine. And what you can see here is that we do have a large renal clearance component. We also have some CYP3A4 metabolism, CYP2C8. And there's also a small additional, uh, uh, an unknown component here, a metabolic component, um, which we can capture in the model, but we don't really know uh, what is contributing to this uh, metabolism. So just an important point here, just to reiterate that, that we have to, in, specifically, if we're interested in looking at the younger ages where we want to apply the CYP ontogenies, then it's important to understand the full disposition of the drug. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my pre presentation, that is not always the case. But for chloroquine, it's, um, we, we do understand the uh, metabolism. So that was just, um, you know, just a quick example of, of talking about how we can actually predict uh, exposures in children. Um, what I'm going to move on to now is talking about dosing or dosing strategies in pregnant women with COVID-19. Now, obviously, we know that uh, chloroquine, it's, uh, it can be given as first-line treatment for malaria in pregnant women. Also, hydroxychloroquine, this is another drug that is being repurposed or being investigated for the treatment of COVID-19. And I think what's, um, and this drug has been used in uh, pregnant women for um, treatment of lupus. And it's typically used at a dose of 200 to 400 mg QD, but can be used, uh, but it's often given over monthly periods, in other words, chronic dosing. So the model that was published by Yao et al. Um, a few months earlier was used in these simulations, which is slightly modified. But what I'm showing here is the hydroxychloroquine, a number of different dosage regimens have actually been put forward um, and are currently being investigated. And if we have a look at these here, the bottom three, the gray, the blue, and the brown, they're representative of 200 to 400 mg, uh, either for five days or certainly given over a four-day period. And really, these are the exposures uh, typically, or this is the dosing level that has been given so far in pregnant women with lupus uh, who have been treated with hydroxychloroquine. So if you just focus on that for the moment, you can see that for two other dosage regimens that are being investigated for treatment of COVID-19 using hydroxychloroquine, they're much more aggressive and significantly higher um, plasma exposures are attained. And therefore, if we want to be able to simulate or, uh, or decide whether, or determine whether the exposure is going to be similar in pregnant women, we have to be able to model this somehow. And what I'm showing here are just some of the physiological changes that have been incorporated in the pregnant population within the SIMSIP simulator. And this is having a look at the, um, just the, uh, we've got the different trimesters here, the different gestational age on the, on the bottom of each axis, and just the changes here. 
One of the ones that I want to draw your attention to is the activity of the CYP enzymes, because for some CYP enzymes, including CYP1A2, CYP3A4, and CYP2D6, we know that there can be changes over the gestational period and the different trimesters, and sometimes come back and then come back to normal. So this is important to consider. So if we want to be able to, um, and this is some of the, uh, this publication here is just showing the uh, a discussion really on drug dosing in pregnant women and application of PBPK model modeling, and it contains a lot of the references. Uh, where the changes in pregnant women that can be used in PUK modeling are described. So if we go on and simulate one of these uh, dosage regimens that we don't have data for in pregnant women, this is essentially what we're showing. So this is one of the more aggressive dosage regimens where 200 mg is given every eight hours for 10 days. And what we're simulating here is in the brown, non-pregnant women, and then in the yellow, pregnant women. And you can see here that there is a small reduction in exposure, but, uh, but certainly not a huge difference. And so I'm not making any recommendations here about dosage regimens in pregnant women. What I'm trying to show you is that we can use PDPK modeling to assess these different dosage regimens in a pregnant population. And just to mention here as well, um, while I'm showing you these slides, is this population has probably been applied, has been applied for about 15 to 20 different drugs. There are an increasing number of publications out there showing the application of PBPK modeling uh, in pregnancy. So, so far, what I've talked about is simulating in um, the exposure of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in the uh, plasma. But obviously, as um, Patrick mentioned at the beginning, really what we're interested in, because COVID-19 is a respiratory disease that affects the lungs, we're very interested in being able to predict the lung exposures of these particular drugs. And what I'm showing you here, I'm not going to go into the complexity of this, but just to show you that we do have this complex lung model that allows us to simulate the exposures of drugs in the uh, epithelial lining fluid, in the lung mass itself, in the blood, in the also lower upper airways and the right and the left lung. So different areas of the lung, we can actually simulate these changes. So if we have a drug that we're interested in, what we can do is develop a PDDK model for this drug, simulate the plasma concentrations, and of course, where we've got clinical data available, we can verify the actual PDPK model itself because it's important to be able to do that. Um, and then what we can do is simulate the epithelial lining fluid concentration or the concentration of the drug. And not all of the time, but in some cases, we do have this, these data available. And in fact, the permeability limited lung model has been verified for about 15 uh, to 20 different drugs that are used for the treatment of TB, where concentrations were available in the epithelial lining fluid or in fact were available in lung tissue itself from biopsies. So it's important to note that um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, they have high log P values and are weak bases um, with um, relatively high PKA values. And this makes them susceptible to uptake in the lung. And therefore, if we actually have a look at these simulations that have been run here, on the left-hand side, we've got the chloroquine. On the right-hand side, we've got hydroxychloroquine. Just looking at two different dosage regimens that have been used in clinical studies, on the left-hand side here, what we're showing you is the solid blue line is the, is the exposure in lung based on total drug. And then the red line is showing you the plasma concentration based on total drug. You can see that there's a significant increase in exposure in the lung. For chloroquine, we're saying that it's about 170-fold higher. And for hydroxychloroquine, we're saying it's about 240-fold higher. Also, what we're showing here is the, and the green bands is showing the range of the reported EC50 values that have been reported for each of these drugs for uh, against the SARS-CoV-2 virus in um, in vitro. Um, 
Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is make sure that we've got concentrations high enough in the lung that are going to be able to target uh, this virus. And therefore, it's important to be able to have an understanding of what the relative concentrations are relative to these in vitro values here. And in fact, if we get to the point where we know what the target concentration is in the lung, then what we can do is essentially use this model uh, and use the lung model within the PBK model to simulate different dosage regimens to get the actual dosage regimen that we want in order to be able to attain that target concentration. So you'll be pleased to hear that um, this is my last slide. What I just wanted to uh, finish off with here was just to sort of re recap, really, uh, of the type of data that we need and the things that we need to think about going forward. As I mentioned right at the beginning of my presentation, we had a series of uh, compound files that were developed. Um, the development started five years ago and uh, took three years. Uh, but going forward, if we know that we uh, the, the drugs that we're going to be interested in, what we can do is make sure that we've got these compound files in place and the relevant data. Also, the compound files that we do have in place at the moment, we do know that there are data gaps. And therefore, what we want to do is to be able to generate the right data to make sure that we can have these files for optimal application. So for example, I mentioned in the case of chloroquine, we're confident about predicting in pediatric subjects because the disposition of the drug is well understood. In the case of hydroxychloroquine, it's less well understood. We know there's a renal component, but there's also a SIP component. So more can be done there. It's also important, I've shown you the different data sets that are required in order to be able to look at the um, different populations. Uh, we also have renal impairment populations, which is a comorbid disease associated with uh, COVID-19. But all of this takes time, and we need to make sure that we have the right data available and that those um, sources are available for everyone to use. Also, it's important for us to perform more extensive verification. Uh, there are an increasing number of publications where PBBK modeling has been applied in pediatrics, in pregnancy, but also other populations as well. And I think this is something as well, I think, that's probably formed part of discussions for design of clinical protocols. You know, how, mu how many of these ongoing clinical studies are actually are we actually taking PK samples from? Because you know a lot of these dosage regimens are ones that haven't been studied previously, and therefore I think it's important to try and obtain these data where possible in the ongoing clinical studies. And finally, just to go back to the previous slide where we were talking about lung concentration, I think it's also important um, where possible to try and find lung exposure data either in the epithelial lining fluid or as part of uh, lung biopsies just to be able to help verify these models or at least build models where we do have data sets available so that we can actually verify the, um, the lung model itself going forward. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And without further ado, for the small amount of time that we've got remaining, I'd like to uh, just thank you all again for your attention and just uh, turn it over to you for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Karen and Jeff and Patrick. As Karen said, we'd like to encourage our audience to submit their questions to our speakers in the Q&A panel. It looks like we have our first one. Are there any known pathophysiological changes that occur in COVID-19 patients that may affect the ADME of administered drugs? This is Patrick. I'm happy to start and take that, uh, take that question. And, and perhaps Jeff or uh, Karen can, can add. I, I guess the one, the one thing that I, that I think about is that we know that with any, um, with any infection and inflammatory response, you get increases of cytokines like IL-6. And IL-6 is known to be a, um, an inhibitor of cytochrome P450 enzymes like, like CYP3A4. Um, so I guess it's, it's theoretically possible that you would have some, some changes in CYP metabolism associated with, uh, with, with, with that kind of, a, kind of a disease and inflammatory reaction. 
Karen, anything to add, or Jeff? Yes, I was just going to add to that. Yes, yeah, so obviously, I mean, that's something that we have actually, in fact, been able to model. Another thing that I was going to mention was that, um, you know, we know that in uh, respiratory disease, uh, and this is something that we've looked at, is that we can actually get a decrease in the lung pH. Uh, as a consequence of having uh, a respiratory disease. And therefore, this can actually affect the partitioning of the drug into lungs. And uh, so I think going forward, that's something uh, else that would be really important to address. Uh, I'll just add, I mean, this is not necessarily an ABMI property, but there is some, some evidence of the uh, fecal oral transmission around uh, the fecal shedding in the stool uh, several weeks after diagnosis. So. This is obviously something that we need to keep in track of when uh, you're talking about children who are not toilet trained. Great points. I think this is a question for Karen. For the design of ongoing clinical trials for COVID-19, do you have a sense of how many teams worked with PBPK models to quantify systemic and lung exposures prior to choosing the dose and starting the trial? I would say that um, certainly based on my experience and interactions, I think that the majority of them would uh, would have had um, some discussion about PVK modeling. There have been an increasing number of publications coming out over the last um, couple of months, and uh, these models have been applied where possible. But certainly, um, I would say a, a large number of them would have um, um, used PVK modeling to inform on dose regimens. Someone wants I don't to think know. I'm overstating that, oh. am I, Patrick? <laughs> I think it's I think it's highly variable. Um, I, I think that uh, what we've seen is um, you know those those studies that are supported by Gates Foundation and drugs like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, um, and, and and some of these compounds ha have been. Um, I, I, I think in in Working with uh, and, and seeing other um, other smaller companies that may be trying to repurpose old drugs, I, I think it's less common. Yeah, sorry. Obviously, I'm biased. <laughs> um, someone wants to know: Is there a possibility of switching from uh, IV to intramuscular for convenience of dosing of the recently improved, recently approved drug remdesivir? Maybe I can I can take that one and and I'm not sure um, I, I have very very little information and, and uh, couldn't really comment on, on remdesivir dosing. Someone wants to know this is for Karen. What contribution of CYP enzymes that you used for the pregnancy hydrochloroquine? Uh, sorry, what are the contributions of the different CYP enzymes that you used for the pregnancy hydrochloroquine model simulations? What changes were made on the Yo et al. model for hydrochloroquine? Yeah, so uh, so that was one of the points that I was I was trying to make really was that uh, at the moment in terms of the hydroxychloroquine, we know that there's a renal component which is about 25%, and that the rest of it is metabolism. And at the moment, the best that we can do is assign that SIP related. So if you think back to the uh, PBK model that I showed you, the enzymes that are affected in the pregnancy model are SIP 182, 2D6, and uh, 3A4. So um, we're not really expect. Well, that's what we that's what we're aware of at the moment. Uh, but yes, in answer to the question, I, I wasn't able to assign it, assign it to any enzymes, and therefore that's a data gap that we need to address going forward. Another question for you, Karen: Is there a SimSIP repository file for remdesivir, or are you planning to create one? So there isn't one available. Um, obviously, it is of huge interest, and we're looking at the data that are available. But the problem is, I mean, it's the availability of data. You know, in terms of because the data that we need are obviously the clinical data to help develop and verify, and then also the in vitro data that I mentioned at the beginning. Given the changes in lung physiology during pregnancy, do the PBPK models account for these differences across the lung volumes? So that is something that I should have pointed out. So at the moment, uh, those changes um, uh, in the lung model, it's, it, 
Yeah, so we will have those changes for the perfusion limited model, but as far as I'm aware, they're not implemented for the permeability limited model, but I can certainly follow up on that afterwards. I think uh, that this next question is referring to uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, but we might need um, clarification. Someone says these are both cationic compounds. Is lysosomal trapping taken into consideration in these models? So lysosomal trapping, that is something that we're currently looking at, and uh, that is very important. And um, it wasn't taken into account in the, in the models. But what we can do is essentially uh, we would have to drop the pH within the lung, and then that is something that we would then be able to uh, look at. Uh, and in fact, the increase in the partitioning into the lung, it increases by about, uh, I think, about 400-fold for chloroquine and about 20-fold for uh, hydroxychloroquine when you drop the pH, which is essentially what is happening in lysosomal trapping. It's like this is our, our last question from the audience. Someone wants to know, to what extent do these PVPK models replace the need to include pregnant women and children in clinical trials for COVID treatments or, or preventions? Um, or will they merely uh, enable faster approval for the use of medications in these populations? I'm going to let Jeff handle that one. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I think my comment to this would be the, the big importance for, for having this bank and uh, repository of PDVK models is that we can design better trials. I, I wouldn't say that we, we can avoid doing those studies because I think the complementary piece is actually collecting the outcome data. And this also makes the case for, for sharing the real world experience with these compounds as they become utilized. But uh, I think what we can do with them is design better trials. We can make better interpretation. And for most, uh, and shortly, as you saw in Karen's presentation, we can do a much better job at coming up with the target doses and interpreting the data. Great. Thank Great. you so, so much, Jeff, Patrick, and Karen. And thank you to our audience for their attention and their great questions. Before concluding the webinar, we have a few short announcements. Today's session was presented in partnership with the American Society for Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics. ASUPT has two upcoming members-only webinars you don't want to miss. On May 6th, ASUPT will have an interview series featuring Dr. Dan Hartman. On May 12th, ACPT will present application of QST in drug cardiovascular safety assessment. You can register for these webinars via ASCPT.org forward slash online hyphen learning. We are also co-sponsoring two additional webinars this month. Tomorrow, May 7th, Sertara's Dr. Craig Rayner will be moderating CITEL's webinar, COVID-19 Response new opportunities and implication for the future of drug development in emerging, com in emerging economies. Visit cytel.com forward slash events to register. On May 14th, Sertara's Dr. Michael Dodds, Samir Muksasi, Yuan Zhang will, will present Model Informed Drug Repurposing, Applications for COVID-19, put on by Pharmacometrics Africa. To register, visit pmxafrica.org. Finally, our next Sertara webinar will be on May 12th. Dr. Nastya Kassir will present FDA approval of oral testosterone replacement enabled by Phoenix NLME and Trial Simulator. Visit sertara.com forward slash webinars to register. On behalf of Sertara, I would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. This concludes the webinar. Goodbye and have a great day.